Specifically today, we're going to talk a little bit about oil spills and kind of what happens after the cleanup. So I think, you know, a, as we're probably all aware at this point, we know about kind of really large oil spills. So this is the, the explosion in the Gulf in April 2010, um, the, the Deepwater Horizon rig, um, which led to, you know, three, you know, multiple months of oil gushing um, into the Gulf of Mexico, uh, you know, kind of coating beaches, covering that whole area. So we know a lot, um, you know, this is kind of one example and has been kind of the biggest thing in recent memory about what happens. Um, Oil spills happen in a lot of different ways. So one of the other common things we see are ship groundings or, um, and, and I think so this is the Costco Busan. In, um, in 2007, it ran into the Bay Bridge, for those of you who were out there, opened up a 100-foot uh, gash in the side of the ship and leaked fuel oil um, all over the bay, disrupting commercial and recreational fishing for months. Um, that's another kind of common type of thing. We see oil tankers as well. Um, another thing we see a lot more of now that kind of gets into the news are pipeline spills. So this was 2010 on the Kalamazoo River, the Enbridge pipeline um, spilled oil into the river. And kind of what's become a ubiquitous site is, you know, we all know about how cleanup works. We've got oil booms. We've got all the people out there in their Tyvek suits. Um, we're collecting up bags of oily trash and putting it away. We're also pretty familiar with the other sites that we see. We know about the old birds. So here's pelicans from the Gulf of Mexico. Um, we, you know, we know what we do with the birds. We've got, you know, we, we see the pictures. We bring them to rescue clinics. Um, we've got the dawn, you know, the dawn commercials to wash off those birds. Um, and then we've got other things. We've got sea turtles again. This was something that we uh, thankfully don't see as much of in oil spills, but again, any kind of major oil spill. So this is both, you know, sea turtles weren't safe whether they were on, whether they were juveniles out at sea, um, nesting turtles coming into land, there was oil everywhere. Um, and so we see these images, we know what happens, we know that everybody goes out there and they clean up the spill and we've got thousands of people, you know, well, depending on the size of the spill, we've got thousands of people working so we're trying to get to back do their to jobs. Um, it can take, you know, sometimes it takes a month, sometimes it takes years, sometimes it takes decades. But we know that happens. But the whole time that that's been going on, we've lost the benefits that those, in, you know, there are things that die that are never coming back. There are fishing trips that people were going to take with their kids that they never got to take. There are, you know, th there are all of these, these complete cycles of, of life that have been disrupted. And so the question became like, what do we do about that? You know, there, there's this whole gaping hole in thinking about response and cleanup. For me, this all came back to, and really for this whole thing, it came back to this spill, which happened a year before I went to RSI, um, the Exxon Valdez. So ship grounded off, tanker grounds off Alaska, spills oil, everything. This was the first kind of, in some ways maybe it's like the first really televised oil spill. I don't know what it becomes because it's not the worst. Um, there had been blowouts before then. There had been other spills that released more, but this is it. This is the spill that captured our imagination and captured our desire to move forward. This is what told us we need to move forward. And for me, I was 15. Um, I was you know, working as a junior naturalist at the local nature center. This made a big enough impact on me that when I got to RSI the next year, my fact about my hometown was that the, the Exxon Valdez had been renamed the Exxon Mediterranean and was now registered at the Port of Wilmington. Um, you know, that, that is what I came and said. And what, I, what did I study at RSI? I was lucky enough to go the year we were out in San Diego, and I said I want to do marine ecology and bio, in biology, and I worked at Scripps Institution of Oceanography, and it was an amazing experience and said, you know, this, this is something that we can care about, that we can do things about. So what do we do? What happened? Because that really was the turning point. The next year, I mean, think about how legislation works. The next year, the country passed the Oil Pollution Act, 
which set into play some like massive changes in how we respond to oil spills. One of the biggest things it set up was money. It said that on every barrel of oil, you're going, there's going to be a tax, and that tax is going to go into a fund that is going to help with responding to oil spills. Um, and it meant that people, you know, that, that agencies knew, private companies knew that if they went in to respond to an oil spill and do things, that the money was guaranteed to start up. That it wasn't a question of was somebody going to pay them, was the RP going to, you know, was the responsible, you know, person going to have enough money to pay them. They knew that, that they were backed and they were going to get paid and they could go out and do it. The other big thing that it set up, and this is where I come in, is it set up what we call natural resource trustees. It said that there are government agencies, there are tribes, there are you know, federal, state, tribes who have responsibilities and rights to the natural resources that they hold in trust for their people. And that they can go out and, and basically be the plaintiff. They are the plaintiff. They can defend their resources. Um, and so, and that's who we work for. So I, I'm a government consultant. I do most of my work for the federal government, also work for tribes and states. Um, but that's where we do most of our work. And the, then the next point it got to was that it's not enough to clean up. That we need to go a step further and figure out what happened over time, what are these losses. We need to clean up, but then we also need to do what, we, what became known as compensatory restoration. to make, basically, to make up for the losses that were incurred, and then even, even that, getting into the economic side of it, taking into account the fact of, of kind of discounting and the fact that if, if you have had losses for, for decades, that, that that becomes more important than some kind of far off in the future impacts. You know, if we do restoration 20 years after an oil spill happened, it's not one for, you know, that's not one for one. We've had a lot of losses accruing. So the main thing that, came into being in terms of this, how does this compensation work, was to say, you've got some loss. So here we've got that any, any kind of resource, whether you're counting numbers of, um, you know, numbers of otters, or are you looking at the benthic, you know, at the benthic productivity of an area, you've got some baseline that you work at. And when you have an event like an oil spill, you're losing it. And there's going to be some, you know, there's some sort of cleanup, there's some sort of recovery but that it takes some time to get back to where you were. Maybe you never get there, but th that's what happens. And that then if we do kind of, in addition to clean up and that restoration, if we do extra projects, if we do what we call compensatory restoration, we can, we can make up for that difference. And we can kind of give people something extra. So how do we do that? And this is kind of what, this is what we, this is what kind of has become my life work and, and a lot of what we do, and it involves everybody. It, we have, we work with physicists, we work with biologists, we work with engineers, we work with chemists. Um, you know, it, we have people kind of from all walks of life, uh, economists, you know, social scientists, all coming together to figure out what are the problems that are happening with a spill and how are we going. So the first step we get to is, is fate and transport. We need to figure out, um, and this is where particularly the engineers come in, but we got a lot of chemists, we've got a lot of people, you know, we're interpreting satellite imagery to do these things. We're saying, how far did the oil go? So this is um, after, so this Macondo well, this is the Deepwater Horizon, um, as it's better known as, but that was the well, wellhead they were at. And this is looking at, you know, kind of how many days of oiling were there in different places across the Gulf. We spend a lot of time developing these kinds of maps. Oops, sorry. Too fast. So the next thing we need to think about is exposure. Like what happened? Where does the oil go? What different, you know, what kind of, what different habitats do we need to look at? Where are we thinking about? So this brings in the ecologists. It brings in the oceanographers who know where things go. Um, we've got kind of everybody working together. We're thinking about, in this case, we've got it coming into shore with the waves. We've got, um, we've got it sinking as bacteria eat it. It's turning into marine snow and falling on the, uh, on the bottom of the ocean. Um, we've got exposure to, you know, so we're, we're figuring out, like, what are all the places we need to look at for injury to figure out what has happened in this whole interim. The next thing we do is we figure out what got you know, what's dead? Is a, lot of what, a lot of what I do is what's dead. Um, but is, is how did stuff react to this, this oil that got on them? You know, how, how, how bad is it? What's happening? So this is a reference plot here. 
the, you know, this is Spartina, it's a common beach grass, looks fine. This is a heavily oiled area that should, you know, that if you'd been there six months earlier would have looked like that. Um, and that's what happens when it gets covered in oil. And so we know that we're losing not only the vegetation, but all of the services that that vegetation provides. All of the things that live on it, the marsh periwinkles, the things that eat it, the fact that that vegetation traps sediment and protects your coast. Um, all of that is, is part of what we, we are adding up when we think about what has happened over time. So, um, and then again, as I said, we count a lot of things. Some of it's sad, some of them are dead. Um, some of them were hopefully, possibly, aren't going to be dead. Um, yeah, I, during deep water, I learned a lot about necropsy terms. It was, it was not great. But we we spend a lot of time counting things, figuring out, and this is you know like systems, but you know kind of population dynamics, like what's there, how much do we expect to be there. Um, we had to go out and do you know there's whole studies on if you go out and look for dead birds, what percentage of them do you actually find? How many have been eaten? So in addition to being out in the field and doing things, we also have to do things. We do things in the lab. So in this case, we're looking, we took, so the source oil, like all of, you know, the, the, you know we, we take oil and we say, how much of it does it take to kill things? Um, so this is a big part of it. These are mahi-mahi uh, embryos and putting them in water that has oil mixed into it and basically what concentration kills things. Um, so we spend a lot of time on that because this can be used to say if you had, we know exposure, we've already talked about our, you know, we've had our people out mapping, we know where the oil is, um, where did the exposure get to, um, and we can figure out what probably died. And then the good part is we get to think about, you know, how long till things get better. So we go and look at these places, we go back a year later, we go back two years later, we look at other people's studies about how long it takes things to recover, and we can kind of figure out when, when do we think we're gonna get back to baseline? How are things improving? What's our trajectory going to be? And then the best part is at the end, too, we also get to think about restoration. So this is a, um, a dune restoration project um, that's going to kind of protect areas. <laughs> you know, unfortunately, there's, a there's actually a bunch in the panhandle that we're not so sure about right now. Um, but there's a lot of projects, and we think about what are the benefits these are going to bring. How many, if we lost a whole bunch of ma marsh periwinkles and all these things, um, when that, those marshes got oiled, what's going to happen next? Just to kind of wrap it up, I mean, this is what we do. We go from the injury assessment, figuring out what's been hurt, how long it's gone on, and what sort of things can we do to bring it all back to health. Um, and one of the main things, and this is where I spend a lot of my time, is just how much information um, we capture as part of this. So, I mean, obviously, Deepwater Horizon is a massive example of this, but as we get more electronic, this is happening with even kind of the smaller spills and things that have happened since then. Um, but there's just so much information that's collected. Um, we can know so much about all of these. We've got drones going out and taking things. We're using satellite imagery. Um, we, you know, there's people out measuring the marsh. Um, there's, there's just a ton of information. And kind of building these information systems is a lot about what we do, too. Um, and then again, this is the deep water, part of the Deepwater Horizon settlement ended with $8.7 billion for natural resource restoration throughout the Gulf of Mexico. Um, this is from Texas through the Panhandle, and there is a ton of stuff going on. So this is from a, a, a public website, Gulf Spill Restoration, um, that, that we help NOAA run, and these are showing you projects throughout the Gulf that are in process. These are all, this is where the money is going. So if you want to know where that $8.7 billion went, the financial tracking is there. You can see the projects people have planned. You can read why they're doing things. You can go to their public comments and argue about what they're choosing to do. But this is what's out there, and, um, and we're trying to help people get that restoration done as well as possible. This is it. <laughs> I don't know if I have any time for questions or not, but one, okay. I would say uh, communication is a re actually a really big thing and just having, when you get to this scale, when, I'm sorry, when you get the scale of Deepwater Horizon, communication, it, in most cases, I would say 
having that the more is, is getting real time information. So the more the kind of more real time mapping of where the spills are, where teams should be going and doing assessments, um, what's happening, what resources are in places. Um, the more real time that can get, that's been the the biggest thing, and that's where we're spending we spend a lot of effort, and I think that is really one of the biggest things. Depends greatly on where you spill it. Um, so, I mean, for example, if this spill, if the deep, well, sorry, not that spill right there, not that Lego spill. <laughs> um, you know, it, it, it's how sensitive are the habitats that are there. And one of the main things is actually, one of the things built into the Oil Pollution Act is that to the extent we're talking about damage to resources, we're dealing with replacement costs. So a lot of that, it varies greatly. Like if you spill, like, you know, if you spill in San Francisco or you spill in, you know, a, an urban, like a major urban area, the costs of buying land, you know, of doing projects are so much higher than other areas that the amount, that the cost of the amount of restoration you need to do is far higher than if you spill that in, say, the Gulf of Mexico, actually, where land is cheap. Um, so the per, like, you know, in some ways they got off easy because, like, if this had happened in, you know, uh, you know, in, in a different estuary that had higher prices or something like that, um, it's all that. So it, it, it scales to the cost of the actual restoration because it is a, what we call a service-to-service -service scaling. So you're, you're scaling based on the natural resources. 